last year. It's called Sanctuaries of Segregation. And basically what these folks did was they came and integrated groups to white churches in Jackson in an attempt to come to worship, and they were turned away. In fact, as you can see, uh, the ushers there are basically guarding the church door and preventing them from coming in. Now, I, I've, I include this picture for two reasons. One is that uh, I'm pretty sure that this was the morning that my brother and my mother and I sat in our car across the street and watched. I was, I was nine years old, and uh, these five people were arrested by those Jackson policemen and were carried away to jail. The other reason is that the man up in the top left corner is the only person on the steps facing the group who was sympathetic with what they were trying to do. And he was a, a member of the church. That's my dad, who uh, died about three and a half years ago. He was a religious professor at Millsap, as I said. Ed King, the white Methodist minister who was chaplain at Tougaloo and one of the leaders of the Jackson movement, had asked my dad, as a member of the church, to be there to observe. I didn't know this picture existed until about five years ago when my friend Carolyn DuPont's book, Mississippi Praying, was published, and I got my copy in the mail, and lo and behold, the pictures on the cover. I didn't even know that know it existed. Um, so, uh, you know, I grew up in this church, uh, first through fourth grade. We went every Sunday. I had wonderful Sunday school teachers. In fact, uh, my favorite son, the husband of my favorite Sunday school teacher, is the man standing top center with his arms folded right there. And I know. Uh, I'm certain that many times I had heard her and other Sunday school teachers say that God loves everyone. So it made no sense to me to see these people arrested just because they wanted to come to church. About two months ago, I participated in a panel discussion at Tougaloo College, the historically black school that was the center of the Jackson movement. This is the chapel in the chapel at Tougaloo. And one of the other panel participants was Ida Hannah Sanders, one of the two black students who was arrested that day. I got to meet the other one, Betty Poole, at an event in Chicago about 10 years ago. Uh, but I got to meet Mrs. Sanders on that day and so had to get a picture with her. And one of the things that I said in my remarks in the panel was, um, I talked about how I had watched uh, with my mother and brother as they were arrested, and I said, you know, of all of the things that I have wished in my life, one of the most fervent wishes I've remained, uh, I've retained, is that we could have worshiped together on that day. So it was really kind of a wonderful thing for me to get to meet her and to say that to her. This is a picture of Fannie Lou Hamer, a sharecropper from Sunflower County, Mississippi, who, for, uh, in my opinion and the opinion of many other folks, is the most important civil rights leader in the state of Mississippi uh, during those years. Um, and she, this is uh, something, she was talking about Freedom Summer, which happened uh, in 64. But she said, our prayers and all we'd live for started to be translated into action. Now we're doing something that, not only, that will not only free the black man in Mississippi, but hopefully will free the white one as well. And I think that's really important. Because in whatever situation there is where racism continues to exist, of course it harms African Americans. It harms them terribly but it also hurts white folks spiritually uh, as, as long as they are willing to put up with that kind of situation. And folks, we have not solved those problems yet. One last slide. This is a picture of Jack Troutman, one of the signers of Born of Conviction. He was pastor at the Big Point Methodist Church in Jackson County on the coast. His mother, uh, all Mississippi stories involve a lot of, everybody's related to everybody else, <laughs> um, even across racial lines uh, often. And uh, 
the irony here was that Jack's mother was Governor Ross Barnett's cousin. When the Board of Conviction statement came out, uh, she was very disturbed that his name was on it. His brother was so angry at him, he told him, you betrayed the family. So Jack wrote a letter to his mother in February of 1963, and thank the Lord he saved it. And here, here's part of what he said to her in explaining why he signed the statement. It is not for the Christian to conform to public opinion, but to let the love of God transform them into the personality of Jesus Christ, who looked upon all people as of infinite worth. Who are we to blame for such radical beliefs? Jesus Christ, who was the most radical and unpopular preacher that ever lived. So thank you. I think we have time for a, a few questions. If anyone has a question or a comment to make. Uh, yes, sir, in the back. You know, according to history, it doesn't suggest that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. He was a very interesting person. And yet, in America, I think the trans transformation of him into the Caucasian American yeah. person, yeah. do you feel that that's partly to blame for situations like that in Mississippi? Well, either that or it's just, it, it's, 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 uh, it illustrates it, I think. Uh, the, the, one of the churches that my wife served in rural um, Kemper County, and our first appointment out of seminary had one of these cheesy stained glass windows up, you know, more modern sort of stained glass windows, and it was a picture of Jesus, and he had blue eyes. <laughs> and in fact, our daughter used to say, "I'm going to go to Chapel Hill and see the blue-eyed Jesus." Uh, yes, I mean, sure. Uh, we we tend to make Jesus over into our own image, and uh, I think I think. Um, you know, it's sort of a chicken egg question that you're asking, I think. But um, I, I, you know, the the, um, and I'm not sure I have any deep insight on that. But but yes, I, I think it clearly is related. Yes, ma'am. Um, you had several comments from publications uh -huh. um, in the White Methodist Church. Uh -huh. Were there any public um, statements from the black? Ex excellent question. Uh, one of the things I should say is that uh, at the time, um, in the early 1960s, uh, the Methodist Church had more African American members <laughs> by far than any other traditionally white Protestant denomination in the United States. And that may still be the case, although I, I, I'm not sure, but, but it definitely was the case then. Uh, but we were segregated at that point, and that, that ended in the late 60s and early 70s. Yes, um, one of the things that I did was I talked with some black ministers that I knew in Mississippi who were in separate conferences then, but um, had some, uh, certainly had awareness of what was going on. In fact, they knew much better what was going on in the white church than the whites did what was going on in the black church. But there was a uh, the central jurisdiction, which was the... Um, uh, jur the the um, juridical entity that all the black annual conferences were in at the church at the time had its own publication, and the editor of that publication, who was eventually elected a bishop, um, wrote an editorial about it. He also ran a copy, he ran the statement itself, but he wrote an editorial praising it. Uh, there were... Um, you know, the, the, there was then, um, and st still are in some places, uh, a pretty vibrant African American uh, secular press, and I found mentions of, of it in, um, in there. So, yes, they definitely knew it was happening. One of the ministers that I talked to that I knew very well, African American minister, you know, his, his comment was, well, we, we didn't really think that the statement itself was all that powerful. I mean, it was just quoting the discipline and that sort of thing. But we were worried about the fact that these ministers were, uh, many of them were probably going to leave Mississippi. Because even in 1963, he said, we knew we were going to be in the same conference with them eventually, and we didn't want to lose potentially good colleagues. So um, 
So yes, I mean that, that they were very aware of it. But since you've been thinking about this type of uh, risky witness, have you seen any comparable kinds of risky witness by uh, Methodists or other religious leaders in the last three or four or five years? Uh, yes. Um, you know, there, I, in, in the last chapter, I talk about some of that a little bit. I talk about the, the issue related to homosexuality in the denomination, which is threatening to split it. Um, I have seen uh, several different attempts on the part of ministers and lay people and others to uh, make some public, for instance, um, United Methodist bishops back in the 80s uh, issued a pastoral letter on the nuclear weapons crisis, um, et cetera. You know, I think one of the problems with that now, though, is that um, the printed word has um, unfortunately been cheapened quite a bit <laughs> in our culture. Uh, we, we have such information overload. Basically, uh, that statement published in the Methodist paper in early 1963 uh, was read by a good many white Methodists. And, and of course, the fact that it was also um, distributed to the wire services meant that it it was widely reported on. These days, it seems more like, you know, a lot of times statements are sort of a drop in the bucket, so it's more difficult. But yes, I mean, there are folks who have, uh, uh, in 1996, there were 15 Methodist bishops who published a statement saying, we don't agree with the denomination's position that homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. One of those bishops, by the way, grew up in Chapel Street Church, where uh, the, that I had the photo of. She's she was out in the western jurisdiction, but um, so yeah, there there have been attempts, and there's, you know, I think ultimately it's a question of uh, how much do our words matter, um, in, in um, and, and what is the most effective way to witness to what we believe uh, Christ and God are, are calling us to be and do um, in these days. So did the, did the editor of the, the Mississippi, is it the Advocate, mm -hmm. did he suffer any ramifications? Yes. That, that's uh, something else that I talk about in the book. All three of those older white men, all born in the 1890s, who publicly supported Born of Conviction, suffered consequences for it. Um, in the case of uh, Reverend Ashmore, um, and it wasn't just this one thing, he had become... Uh, again, I think partially because of his wife's influence, he had become much more willing for uh, to take stands uh, that were unpopular, and uh, the the advocate suffered for it. A lot of white Methodists um, canceled their subscriptions to it. Um, he was uh, given an award by the uh, National Methodist Church in 1965, sort of celebrating him as editor of the year. And it was mainly a way to thank him for the courage that he had shown, not only in publishing Born of Conviction, but in a whole bunch of other um, cases like that. So, so yes, there's always consequences when you go against the grain. Yeah, Bunny. Um, can you comment on uh, Reverend Ashmore's comments about the Methodist Church being divided between the You know, that, that, that's a very interesting thing. Um, one of the absurdities of those um, church arrests in 1963 and 64, one of, those, one of the absurdities of that was that, um, you know, all they had to do was let them come in and worship. They, they, they probably wouldn't, I mean, they would have stayed for that service, but uh, it was, you know, um, you, it is not unusual to find a few African-American members in some white Methodist churches in Mississippi now. There are very few that have been really successfully multi-ethnic, but, but uh, in fact, uh, I, the, the one that has been the most successful in the state 
uh, I went to that church in college when it was just, and was served by one of the signers of Born of Conviction, by the way. Um, uh, it was uh, one of the first integrated churches in the conference. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, I suppose uh, there's lots of ways to answer that question. One of the ways would be to say that um, there were a lot of us in the 1960s who were a little naive about um, what uh, the Civil Rights Bill and the uh, Voting Rights Act um, would accomplish uh, and, and school desegregation would accomplish. I, mean, I was in the 10th grade when we had real school desegregation in Jackson Public Schools uh, and a lot of my white classmates left the public schools because of that. Um, so I, I guess the, the response would be that uh, one response would be to say that um, we're still struggling with the same stuff. You know, we haven't, I mean, things have changed in many ways, but uh, then again, you, know, you have something like what happened in Charlottesville last August, uh, and, and that reminded me a lot of uh, things that happened in, in the 60s in Mississippi. Yes, sir. Jim Rush, World of 28. Yes. Friend of mine. He's a member of South Carolina United Methodist Church. That's I right. remember that. Mm -hmm. What Jim told me was, and he's still alive, yes, he was kicked out of that church, but he says that the Ku Klux Klan sent a letter to the bishop. And the letter said, if any of these ministers are appointed in June to a church, that church will burn down. He said that along about March, April, a church came open, and the bishop said, we're going to check this out. One of those was appointed to the church. That wasn't June yet, but he was appointed and went there, and the church burned down the next week. A white minister? Yes. Now, Jim said then the bishop called him and these others that were on that list for McLean in and told them, you won't get an appointment in June. I will work to find you an appointment in another conference. And Jim Rush and his brother John Rush, at least one more that I knew, Bill Elkins, I think, they came from Mississippi to the South Carolina country. Uh, yeah, Jim, Jim and John first went to Southern California, but they did, uh, about five years later, ended up in South Carolina, that's right. Yeah, it's an incredibly complex story. Um, I, I, I'm not sure about the accuracy of a white church being burned down, but but I do know that uh, he got <coughs> off, I mean, he had one of the worst experiences of any of the signers, um, and and was very disappointed at the lack of support from the bishop. His father was a district lay leader and, and knew the bishop very well, and he was really disappointed in, in uh, the bishop's lack of support. So uh, I'm glad to know, I haven't seen him since 2004, so I'm glad to know he's still, still alive. I, I assumed he was, but um, but you had your hand up. Uh, yes, what, about what percentage of Mississippi was Methodist? I mean, is that uh, in 62? Uh, well, Southern Baptists always <laughs> the, the largest group. In fact, we used to say that basically one out of three people in Mississippi is a Southern Baptist, and that counts all, you know, including the black population, uh, and there, aren't, there weren't really any um, black Southern Baptists. Um, probably about... Uh, Less than ten percent, maybe eight or nine percent, something like that. Did any of the other churches make any bold statements such as? Uh, you know, it's interesting. Um, the in Jackson, the Catholic and Episcopal churches admitted those interracial groups that came to worship, um, but for the most part, no. I mean, um, the answer is no. Kind of along that same line.
Are you familiar with or do you become aware of any other similar statements or changes that have taken specifically by Methodist ministers within the jurisdiction of this country? Uh, yeah, there's about a 10 page section in chapter 4 on that because, I mean, I, I've often joked that the Borna conviction statement is the second best known white clergy statement for the civil rights era, the first one being the statement by the eight white clergy leaders that Martin Luther King responded to in the um, letter from Birmingham jail. But, um, uh, yeah, the, the, and Born of Conviction was unusual in that um, many of the other sort of efforts like that were ecumenical. Um, the, the closest sort of um, counterpart was uh, ministers in the Methodist conferences in Arkansas responding to the Little Rock Central High event in 1957. Uh, to me, the most, uh, one of the most um, powerful stories among those was uh, in Mobile, Alabama in 1958, black clergy issued a statement calling for a boycott of the bus system if they didn't desegregate it the way it had been done in Montgomery the previous year. And um, there were about 30 white ministers who publicly endorsed that call, and over half of them were Methodists. Um, so, uh, and uh, you know, some of them got in some trouble as well. So, uh, uh, but yeah, there. I mean, th this. But, but I think to me, the reason why this story is so fascinating is because Mississippi was the, as the civil rights folks said, the toughest nut to crack, and. Um, <laughs> You know, and uh, so the fact that they did, they published this right at the height of white resistance to three months after the Ole Miss riot, um, all sorts of other stuff was going on that made it the kind of uh, hornet's nest that it was, I think. <clears throat> so. Well, thank you for your attention and your questions and uh, I'll be happy to sign a book for anyone who would like me to. And uh, great to see you all here. Thanks for coming.